Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Statton. I'm joined by Joel Williams, who is a Vice President of Architecture and Engineering at Fox. I personally am a, uh, one of the principal architects in the Media and Entertainment Group here at AWS. And today we're going to talk about Fox's journey to the cloud, uh, specifically talking about uncompressed live sports in the cloud. So uh, let me introduce Joel. Joel, hi. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, Evan. I'll give a quick uh, overview of, of Fox as a company, so everyone's aware. Uh, Fox is a global media and entertainment company. We have four main business units. Uh, the first one being Fox Entertainment. They deliver primetime uh, content like 911, Gotham, X Files, American Idol. Uh, their content is played out over our national network. We have Fox Sports, which covers all major sporting events, NFL, uh, NBA, MLB, your World Series, Super Bowls, and uh, every professional sports. We have our Fox TV stations, which includes 208 uh, Fox affiliates and 18 O&Os. And then we have our Fox News media division, which includes the Fox News Network, uh, Fox Nation OTT service, and the Fox Business Network. Just to show some uh, quick stats here for you know, content and how much is produced. Currently in AWS, Fox has about 1.2 million assets. Uh, sitting in there, we have a full media supply chain called uh, Fox Media Cloud, which stores all that. We produce about 60,000 hours of raw content an hour. Uh, just in the last uh, month alone, it was about 30,000 assets that have been going up to the cloud and uh, another 30,000 roughly have originated there. And we produce about 16,000 content hours of, of live sports uh, through our Fox Sports company. Thanks, Joel. I want to take a minute to catch people up if you've missed the last episode on Fox Moves to the Cloud. Uh, last year at reInvent, I was joined by Alistair Hamilton, who is SVP of Distribution Architecture at Fox. And we were talking about Fox's uh, first project to the cloud, which was the migration of their distribution services. And so when we talk about the, uh, the production chain of a television network, we were talking about this last year. We'll refer to this again throughout today's presentation. Um, basically, what you're looking at here is working from left to right. You have uh, the live production happening at an event site, such as a stadium. And then that produced feed comes back to a control room area where the signals are received and processed and commercials are inserted. And then the video is encoded and, and mucks together with the other Fox channels that Joel was talking about and then transported out to the right side of the diagram to um, affiliates and cable head ends and the internet, for example. So um, last year we talked about the highlighted part here, which was the encoding and delivery mechanism. And um, for those who don't know, when we're encoding and delivering, we're usually delivering to three different types of locations. So up on the right here, you see uh, what's referred to as a broadcast affiliate. So these are the stations that Joel had mentioned. This is the you know, Fox network that gets delivered to the um, 208 uh, stations throughout the country. And... There, the, um, the network feed, the national feed, is um, combined with the local programming, such as local news, for example. And then that signal is encoded again, except this time for the ATSC transmitter uh, for over-the-air distribution so that you can use your antenna on your TV or um, hand it off to the local cable providers. The second type of distribution we were talking about is the cable properties themselves that Fox produces, such as Fox Sports. Uh, in this case, the signal is handed off to MVPDs, um, which are you know, our cable providers in the States, and those signals could go to up to you know, two or 3,000 head ends in some cases, when you think about all the different cable providers that exist throughout the country. And then those cable providers take the signals and they put them onto their local um, area networks for delivery to the home. And then finally at the bottom, the third delivery type is over the internet to various digital MVPDs uh, and content aggregators. And 
then what Alistair did was, after we talked about that, he, he walked us through each step in this production chain that I had mentioned. He gave us a tour of a production truck. Here we see a fellow doing camera switching. So you see he has a large control console in front of him, uh, known as a production control switcher. And um, they're using that to switch camera feeds in real time. There's a director and a producer behind him calling for which camera angles are going to be part of the show. Uh, Alistair walked us through the, um, the data center in Los Angeles that Fox has. Here he's pointing out some of the muxing and encryption equipment used for the satellite transport and um, pointing out that all of these racks of equipment are essentially uh, able to be vacated and give the space back to Fox because they're going to run this in the cloud. And then finally, we talked about what the architecture looks like in the cloud. In this case, um, we have Media Live running in, in AWS and then sending the signal back down on prem uh, as a StatMux signal. And when we say StatMux, we're talking about statistical multiplexing, uh, which is the practice of allocating more bits to more complex content and less bits to less complex content. For example, a sports channel should get more bits because there's a lot of active motion uh, to describe versus a channel with a talking head, like a news interview, which might be able to produce uh, an equivalent um, picture quality with less bits because there's less motion on the screen. And so when you have a fixed carrier, such as a satellite transponder, which is typically 36 megahertz wide, um, you want to fit as many channels as you can into that transponder by muxing them together, but you want to do it in this way. So this graph that we're looking at is um, a demonstration that the overall pool bit rate, in this case, is 100 megabits per second, if you see on the left side. And each of the colors represents how many bits are allocated for a particular channel within the multiplex. And so you can see some are bigger than others. And in doing it this way, you're able to, in real time, um, get the best video quality out of the channels that you're muxing together. And so, you know, th this is a great topic, but I want to ask Joel, you know, what's next? What are we doing now after we've done this distribution piece? Yeah, you know, now that we've accomplished that and we're, we're moving upstream of the diagram, we're going to look at channel origination, processing, commercial insertion. Um, you know, we, we wanted to take a step back before jumping into that and say, you know, these are our goals. How can we how can we achieve these things and look at what's available on the market now and what needed to be developed? So some of our main goals here uh, were how can we do this but still have extreme resiliency, right? How can we leverage multi-AZs, multi-regions? How do we rely less on uh, complex buildings uh, and complex systems within those buildings? Um, how can we achieve the same zero latency workflows that we have on prem now that we've always had, but do them in the cloud, uh, which is one of the biggest hurdles that we've had uh, today. And then how can we, you know, obviously we want better picture quality um, as everybody watches on their devices and we're doing 1080p HDR and 4K. Uh, those things are, are critical to the business to support for future. And then from a financial standpoint, how can we remove these huge uh, capital expenses and uh, turnover year over year on um, product cycles and, and hardware refreshes. Um, so those were our, those were our major driving factors in, in what we tried to accomplish in the next phase. So uh, this diagram here shows with the yellow box our phase two, which is again channel origination, uh, signal acquisition, and processing within the facility that happens now pre pre encode to the uh, the cloud stat mux. So. Diving into what our biggest hurdle has been is really the latency, right? Everyone, everything I should say in Fox is almost alive 24 seven. Um, most, a lot of other cable networks and other things, they just play content out uh, from clips and there's not too much live going on where we're the complete opposite. We don't have too, too much clip play out. We're always in live programming, whether it's a live sports show or studio show or, or live news. So. Latency to the cloud for us as an operational uh, concern was, was huge, and that was our major tackle here. So this diagram is a exploded view of sort of the workflow as a whole, as a, as a traditional 
system, you have your latency from the distribution handoff, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, roughly six seconds. That latency is less critical uh, in the overall schemes to the distribution partners and the, and the people. And while it's still critical and we still want to improve that, the core latency that we had to make this work was to the left-hand side where you see 200 milliseconds on the bottom. That was the operational uh, latency for the person controlling uh, the channel origination for this for the person who is interacting with the live sporting event or the studio doing the feed um, That is what we had to make look just like it would on-prem It would be oblivious to the operator if they were using the cloud or, or something in the equipment room uh, And that's where the hard part came in now something with the industry that that has been uh, going on over a couple of years now and being developed is uh, different formats for video. There's no there's no SDI in the cloud, so that's been our you know the biggest hurdle is there's no standard. Uh, we've looked at video compression formats like ARQ formats to have uh, you know better network latency, uh, but at the expense of video quality. If you have video quality, you have more latency. So traditional ARQ protocols don't really work in a real larger enterprise live sports deployment system. Uh, they also, you know, we have issues with encode and decode cycles. So traditionally, if you're going through a, a playout server or a video server, multi-viewer, whatever it might be, you're, you're doing an encode and a decode cycle, and over time you'll, you'll lower your video quality. You'll have too much noise by the time it comes back out for distribution. So that was another big hurdle that we had to, to overcome. Uh, it's very hard with those those sources too, since there's no standard um, that integration across multiple vendors or across multiple technologies. It usually leads to some bottleneck. There's there's very few things that just kind of work together as they as they should. Um, so you usually run into one thing or another, or you have to sort of bend your own workflow to fit the technology when it should be the other way around. Right? Technology should support should support the workflow. Um, and then the last, probably more more critical piece, was the monitoring control of it. You know, if it, if there's something coming out of a data center three thousand miles away, how do you properly know that it's happening when it should happen? How do you control it? How do you monitor it? How do you understand your network traffic efficiently for the operator? You know, your video quality signal, knowing that it's going from from end to end. So all all these things have been new uh, hurdles that we've uh, we've worked on tackling through this project. Thank you for that. One question, if you don't mind. It's clear that low latency at various points in the workflow is important, but what would you say is the most critical point of latency here and why? Yeah, definitely the, the most critical piece is coordination with sites. So every time you know this commercial insertion uh, is happening, there's a countdown with the remote site or even the control room uh, with going to break. And uh, as these people are counting down, three, two, one, go, we need to be able to to roll our brakes, to insert commercials, to go to the live event, whatever it might be in that moment. There can't be multiple seconds of delay. Um, there can't be a varying set of delay, which is um, kind of an earlier on experience with some of the ARQ. So things need to happen just as they happen now. You press the button, you see the you see the change happen. And we have a an example here of one of our technical directors doing a countdown on FS1 going to a live studio show. And you can see in the middle monitor right hand uh, window, as soon as he counts down 3210, it goes back to our studio programming. Stand by, George, in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So, thank you. Um, you know, what we're going to get into now is, I would say, the meat of how we're addressing together some of these uh, latency and reliability considerations that Joel was just talking about. And so um, the, when we talk about reliability from the perspective of a broadcaster, we're talking in, in many nines of uptime here. Usually the target is five or, or even six nines of availability. And this applies throughout the entire life of a channel. And a channel is usually 24 by 7, you know, all the time. So at some point, a channel got started, and then it just keeps going forever. And so the question is, how do you um, and how do customers 
achieve this in the cloud in a way that's reliable because it's always been the case until now that as Joel described, there's a trade-off right between latency and reliability. And what I mean by that is you can add latency um, such as retransmission buffers and stuff like that using ARQ technology, but adding latency is detrimental to the operation, as Joel was saying. Um, another thing, though, is that if you reduce the latency all the way, you're taking off all of the safeguards about packet retransmission, and thus you find yourself more vulnerable to things like packet loss. And packet loss is, um, is very degrading to a video service, to say the least. Um, and so this is, you know, we started to explore how we might do this and there were existing tools. Um, I'll mention SMPTE 2110, which is a standard that was ratified by, uh, the SMPTE organization several years ago. And what that standard is, is a description about how to send uncompressed pixel data via IP. So, you know, it used to be on a HDSDI wire. Uh, well, it was a coaxial cable that went from point A to point B, and you would sort of daisy chain your broadcast services together using very short, dedicated wires. And this is, you know, it's incredibly reliable to do something like that. Um, but then customers started saying, well, wait a minute, IP is here, and we have 10 gig switches or 100 gig switches even, and so we should be able to do this over IP. And so what came out of that was this SMPTE 2110 standard that rides on top of RTP, um, which rides on top of UDP. And um, what you find here is that 2110 is extremely bandwidth hungry because when you consider the idea of uncompressed video, you have to think about that every time your screen is refreshing with a new frame, it's describing every single pixel. Uh, and so there are millions of pixels on the screen and you wanna refresh that like 60 frames per second to get smooth picture. And so you're talking about gigabits per second of traffic per video flow. And if you have many channels running with redundancy, this easily you know, adds up to terabits, sometimes petabits. Of, of video traffic. And so when customers started to build 2110 networks on-prem, they segmented away from their corporate networks usually and built a 2110 optimized network with as few hops as possible and with very um, um, strict latency and timing requirements about how the packets are paced and sent over the network so that this would work reliably. And it works very well. However, um, in the cloud environment, we have we don't have a purpose-built network just for 2110 video. So, um, you know, we wanted to start testing with the tools we had, and you know, see where we might have room for optimization to uh, to make customers like Joel happy and able to do these workflows in the cloud. So, to give you a sense, we started by doing a test, a very simple test. We sent 2110 traffic through our network. In this case, we were sending big UDP flows, uh, about five gigabits per second each. And what you're seeing in this graph is um, those flows over a period of time. In this case, the sample size is eight flows. And you know, for the most part, all of the packets get from point A to point B. Um, however, you notice in this graph that there are some dropouts here. And those dropouts can happen for any number of reasons, like traffic shifting through the network um, as part of normal operations, for example. But um, this is this would count as a video outage, in my in my opinion, and I think also in Joel's. Um, if you see these dropouts in all the flows, this would represent a few seconds of missing video, and a few seconds of missing video can be extremely detrimental to properly um, broadcasting the story that the director is trying to tell, you know, in the case of a football game or something like that. If those two seconds happened at a moment of a touchdown or something like that, that would be an excruciating customer experience. And so 
we looked at this and we said, this isn't good enough. We need to do something better than this that works in the cloud in order to really make this viable. And so we went and we started asking around to our high performance compute team because they have similar uh, workflows where there are tremendous amounts of data that have to be shared between instances uh, in a timely manner. And they told us about this scalable, reliable datagram. And we abbreviated it with SRD. And so what SRD is, is a protocol that AWS developed um, for HPC applications and now also for video applications that um, uses multipaths through the network, essentially. And so in the case of 2110, you're sending the whole thing over one big UDP flow. And thus, you're relying on just one path through the network to be there all the time. And, you know, when you build for the cloud, it's important to build in a way that is self-healing and resilient. And so um, SRD, we, we thought, was a good candidate for how to transport uncompressed video in the cloud because it uses many paths through the network at once. And therefore, if any one path becomes degraded or experiences a traffic shift for any reason, there are many other uh, we call them flowlets, like subflows of the video that are all lower than the 12 gig. Um, and so all the other subflows wouldn't have experienced an issue at that time. The other thing that SRD has is a very small retransmission buffer um, per flowlet in the order of microseconds, because within an availability zone, um, instances can communicate with extremely low latency in the order of microseconds or single digit milliseconds. But um, we, what we didn't say earlier in the presentation is that retransmission is bad. We only said that retransmission is bad if it results in added latency to the customer experience. However, one of the properties of video running at 60 frames per second, and you can do the math yourself, is that every frame has an allocated time budget to get from point A to point B of 16.6 milliseconds. That's how, that's how quickly our screens are refreshing. Every 16.6 milliseconds, we get a new frame of video delivered to us. And so what we decided was, um, if we can consistently deliver an entire frame of video within that time budget, that we're in pretty good shape. And the idea was, just like the SDI cable on-prem, we should be able to deliver a frame of video in 16.6 milliseconds consistently forever once you start up the flow. And so um, we started doing more testing. That's, that's how we did it. And if you look at this, we compared the SRD results with the UDP results. And I think you would agree that this graph looks much better. We don't see those dropouts anymore. Now, that doesn't mean to say that no packets are ever lost. But what it does mean is that when they are, the SRD protocol will retransmit just the ones that we're missing for a particular flowlet so that not only are the little dropouts less impactful, but actually the entire frame of video is still able to be delivered on time. And so, you know, we said, this is great. This is going to work, we thought. And the one thing we needed to, to build on top of this was what we're calling AWS Cloud Digital Interface, or CDI for short. And really the point of CDI was to give software developers um, the ability to describe their flows in a familiar way. So we didn't want to, to force the industry to come up with new ways to describe video flows and have everybody do their own SRD implementation. No, instead of that, we said, well, what if we create uh, what we're calling an AVM layer, which stands for audio video metadata? What if we create an AVM layer that allows vendors and partners and customers to describe the flows in the same way they did with 2110 in terms of frame rate and frame size and audio payloads and stuff like that? And, and that's what we're calling CDI in combination with the SRD underneath handling the reliable transport between instances. And so now the, the new thing looks like this, where we're saying, 
no longer we're using UDP with big flows. We're going to use SRD as the transport protocol, and we're going to guarantee that the frames get from instance A to instance B within 16.6 .6 milliseconds. Um, and we're going to build this CDI layer on top of that so that vendors in the space can still talk to the um, system in terms of video flows. And then the CDI SDK um, will handle the transmission. And actually, it offloads the, um, the packet processing part to the, to the network card itself. So this helps unburden application vendors from having to coalesce their packets into a particular order like they had to do with, uh, with 2110. So actually, the vendor community has been very receptive to this because it helps them solve a problem too. Um, then, of course, I wanted to share with you some of the results. So these are some CloudWatch performance metrics. Okay, And so what you're seeing with the red bar is... Um, what would be considered a late frame. Again, you, you need to get the frame across within 16.6 .6 milliseconds, otherwise the application that's receiving it won't have the frame in time to render it to its output. Okay, so um, this demonstrates that across multiple hours, across multiple flows, okay, across multiple instances, that there were no late frames. So this is a very positive result. And... You know, the thing I said earlier was it doesn't just have to work for a few hours. It has to work forever. And so we zoom out and, you know, I just wanted to share with you here that um, there were no late frames over many days in this case. And so um, the last thing I want to say about CDI is that because it's uncompressed, it allows you to do some things to the content that you, you wouldn't be able to do in the compressed domain. And one of the things that is sort of obvious is Axel access the pixel data itself. So you might need to do this because you might need to do color correction or you might need to you know, render a graphic over it. In some way, you want to modify the frame. So no longer do your pieces of software need to worry about encoding and decoding. They can just work on the active pixel data. Now, the second thing is that CDI supports the RGBA color scheme. And what that means is that you can send uh, a video essence, as it were, with an alpha channel that would then, you know, tell a, a downstream keyer, as it were, where to overlay a graphic and what the opacity should be and things like this. We thought this was nice because 2110, you know, doesn't do it. So this was another thing, you know, the graphics vendors are pleased that we were able to do this because... They can send RGBA as one essence instead of two. And when you do that, you know, you have less timing concerns and, and stuff like that. And also it requires less bandwidth. Um, you know, the next thing is that it enables people to offload their encoding and decoding from applications. So Joel was talking about playout before. Another example might be a production switcher when you're doing camera switching. These applications are supposed to be good at one thing. They're supposed to be good at playout, for example. I have an application, it's supposed to assemble my channel for me. However, before CDI, these applications actually had to also do encoding and decoding as a, as a matter of necessity, because there was no way to send uncompressed data between instances. And so this unburdens those applications from having to do tangential things that they never wanted to do in the first place, which is nice. Um, and then the last thing is that the AVM layer that I mentioned, um, uh, it, it keeps the mentality of separate essences as was in 2110 so that you can send different essences from different locations. And what that enables you to do is have timed metadata, essentially. And so, you know, one example is SCUDI 104, which is a spec for um, commercial insertion markers and stuff like this. Another is live closed captioning. But really, the point is that you can send any timed metadata via the M, as it were, in the ABM layer and have your CDI connection accurately align the time for the video, the audio, and the metadata. And so what I want to do now, I want to uh, turn it back over to Joel for a minute and ask Joel, you know, so now that we've built these tools together, what, what, how is Fox going to leverage them? 
Yeah, so all these wonderful new tools are, are definitely being leveraged in our new Fox Technology Center, which is being built in uh, Tempe, Arizona. And I want to show the production design that we have going, uh, which utilizes CEI. Uh, you see here on the screen, uh, we'll be using two of the technologies we mentioned, both JPEG XS to encode super, super low latency subframe uh, up into the, the cloud and utilize the CDI connectors to uh, decode the instances, at which point we can use it for play out, multi-viewers, uh, other insertion or um, production elements can be routed and integrated. And then we're gonna send the uh, multi-viewer essentially back down, uh, back into, from CDI back into JPEG XS on-prem so the operator can see what's going on and what they're controlling. Um, this is the production deployment and we'll be uh, I want to also give a little demo of, of part of this happening here so everyone uh, knows that this is a, a real product and is being used. So, yeah. go ahead, Deb. I'm really excited about this, actually. Yeah. Here's what we're going to show you, okay? We're going to show you um, the JPEG XS coming up to the cloud from on-prem through a direct connect. It's going to be decoded to, um, to CDI, which is going to be handed off uncompressed to another instance that's then converting the CDI back to JPEG XS and sending it back on-prem through the direct connect. And we're gonna show you uh, from the SDI spigot in to the SDI spigot out. And um, it's the highlighted part of the diagram that we're talking about here, just as a you know up and back latency test. And so here's, the, here's a video capture of what we see. Um, and so, uh, one of these is the source, the other one's the destination. It's sort of hard to see in the video land, so we took a, a screenshot of what the time code difference is here. And what we're seeing is about six frames uh, back and forth. And if you do that, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I want to call out, you know, we, we did test this before with H.264 and ARQ technologies, and the, the best that we could get in the worst, in the best case scenario was about three seconds. Uh, up and back to the cloud. So comparatively, six frames is astronomically faster. Yeah, six frames is uh, about, is 99.6 milliseconds. I think I did the math before. And remember, this is bi-directional. So if you recall the, the diagram earlier where an operator hits a button and then gets video back, that's unidirectional. So it would be half of this to, to get something back from the cloud. So this is extremely fat. We're, we're really excited about this. Um, and we're also excited about what it enables for customers down the road. Joel, did you want to add anything about this or do you want to talk about next year's preview? I think it leads into next year's preview perfectly. You know, it, it, it enables so many more workflows. So next year we're going to be looking at uh, direct contribution from the venue fully into AWS, uh, essentially being able to bypass the facility altogether. Um, you know, using AWS's backbone from these venues uh, with native with native contribution opens up just an extra extra nice workflow that leads into our our overall plan to to you know lift everything into the cloud. So next year we'll be looking at uh, basically the box on the left there uh, contribution production from from site itself. Thank you so much, Joel. You know, I wanted to. I just want to say thanks for doing this with me. Um, it has been such such a great time to put this presentation together with you. Um, you know, we, we really love working on this project with you. We're really excited about it. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who's, who's watched today. Um, and feel free to look me up on, on LinkedIn if you want to connect. I'm happy to answer any questions. It's been great. Thank you. Yes, thank you.